Good evening. I'm Ariana Cohen Halberstam. I'm the artistic director of Boston Jewish Film and of the Boston Israeli Film Festival. Welcome to our third annual festival and to our International Women's Day screening of Four Mothers, Arba Imahot. I want to thank our festival sponsors, the festival's presenting sponsor, the Fine Family Foundation and CJP. Also, thank you to the IAC and the Consulate of Israel to New England and tonight's partner, the Boston Women's Film Festival. I want to mention that the Boston Women's Film Festival and the Consulate and Boston Jewish Film, Boston Israeli Film Festival are partnering on a screening next week after this festival's over. Um, it's a film called Hope I'm in the Frame about Michal Bat Adam, who was one of Israel's first female uh, film directors. And we'll have a conversation about that on March 18th. So please stay tuned with the Boston Israeli Film Festival to learn more about that event. This festival continues through March 10th, that's Wednesday. Tomorrow night, we'll be having a conversation with director Levi Zinni about his film, um, which is called Menachem Begin, Peace and War. And then on Wednesday, we will be having a conversation with Shai Avivi at 12.30 in the afternoon, who's the lead actor in Here We Are. Joining us tonight, we are well, so pleased to welcome Dr. Rachel Madpis Bendor, who you will obviously recognize from the film Four Mothers. She is the founder and one of the leaders of the Four Mothers movement. She's also a biblical and Talmudic scholar and a writer. Um, today, she will be interviewed by Dr. Lisa Fishbain Jaffe, who is the Shulamit Reinhardt's director of the Hadassah Brandeis Institute at Brandeis University, which is focused on Jewish women and gender studies. In about 20, 25 minutes, Lisa will be asking some questions that are coming from you, the audience. So if you have questions, please put them into the Q&A section and Lisa will get to those um, after her initial conversation with Rachel. Um, and if you need closed captioning, just check the CC button on the bottom and you will have captioning following along with you tonight. Um, thank you, Lisa and Rachel for being here and enjoy the conversation. Thank you. It's a real pleasure, um, Rachel, to be in conversation with you. Um, perhaps we can start with asking about the moment. Um, you have the film that has just come out and you have a book that you've written about your experience with uh, the four mothers that is coming out this spring. Uh, why was the time right now to tell this story anew? Uh, because I have time <laughs> and it's something that I promised myself that I'm going to clean the table one day. I have so many documents. I, I served, uh, not only I came up with this crazy idea and uh, decided that if I'm not going to sleep at night because my son is fighting a war that uh, we are actually uh, more in danger, uh, that the rest of the uh, parliament won't sleep with me. So I'm try I started to be a troublemaker then. And then I uh, continued with being a chairperson for this movement until the, uh, the day it was uh, this bent, the most successful day, the day we left Lebanon in peace. Saying that, so our official name is Four Mothers, not that we were four in number, it's a mythological symbolic name. Uh, being Rachel, of course, and my background in uh, Judaic studies. Uh, so it was four mothers dash living Lebanon in peace. Uh, and uh, after 20 years, I've decided that uh, I need to sit down and uh, take all the publication I did during the, this year. I participated in different conferences in academia. And uh, I've decided that I need to expose the documents that I have in my archive to the rest of the world, and especially to Israeli society, to make them understand that you can make a protest as just regular people wake up in the morning, decided that you are going to change something that's painful and not right, and you can do it. And I want to show how we did it and what was the reaction and uh, uh, how they we were ignored or belittled or any, all of this. So that, let's talk about the name. So the name is, is Four Mothers uh, Leave Lebanon in Peace. 
Was that a name you chose? Was that a name that was given to you by the media, by others? So it's interesting in the archive, you can see the gradual growth of the name. At the beginning, it was um, uh, referring to the names we were called actually. So we were called the mothers from the north, the people from the north, the, the good fans and other names. And then, um, as I'm saying, I'm telling all these stories in the book. So in the book, of course, I will I'll, I'll make a long story, sh long story short that um, I read an article in the kibbutz news, uh, newspaper. I, I'm from a kibbutz in the Galilee, not far from the border. Um, so we were actually experiencing the war uh, in a different way that it was uh, uh, known in the media, that uh, we are being attacked and then we uh, respond back. Actually, it was the other way. Our soldiers were be, uh, got uh, uh, in trouble in Lebanon and then they had casualties in Lebanon and then Lebanon, uh, Leb Lebanon whoever uh, fought against us at that time, uh, 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 put us in bomb shelters. So I was going to expose it and I called uh, the author of a certain article in the kibbutz newspaper, wanting to, to uh, share with him my same experience because he was writing about it. And he wrote in this article, um, how come you mothers are letting your children going you are the taking care of them until they are being 18 how come you're letting them go into any war no question asked and it's exactly how i felt but i didn't dare to say it because it's a big no-no in israel i mean uh, especially where i'm coming from from the kibbutzim you're supposed to be proud that your children and son and this is how we were educated and i guess we continue that uh going to a war uh and sacrificing their life so I invited him, uh, I called him, I, I was teaching at the college on the border, uh, Tel Chai College, and one day at night after my class, I, I was calling him and sharing with him how I empathize with what he said, and I was so surprised that a man wrote it, a soldier, and he said, I have to come and meet with you, and I refused to meet with him because I said, I don't have anything to tell you, why do you want to drive all the way to the Galilee to meet with me? Um, and I was always shocked when they wanted to come and talk to me. I don't have anything to say. I'm just a regular person. I'm just saying it's wrong. Uh, and look at the evidence that we see here. He insisted. And then uh, he said, I'm coming. So I called my friend and said, look, one correspondent want to come and meet with me. I don't have anything to tell him. Please join me. Uh, other mothers that uh, uh, my, my son's classmate uh, mother. So, and one afternoon uh, on a weekday, two of my friends were available. They came to my house. On the way, they uh, convinced another woman that they met and they were three and I was four. And uh, it was uh, a week before Pesach and boom, we got the name for mothers. So then we had to decide and it was very catchy. So then we had to decide uh, if we are going with it. And there is a lot of debate if to continue with a motherly, such a, a gender and, and specific categorize with all the problems of being mothers and all the connotations. And we end up in the um, uh, official day of the, when the movement was established, uh, when we became associ an association to go with for mothers, because this was the name that was given to us, and leave, Le Ed, leave Lebanon in peace. So this was the end of decision. And so after that, we had to fight a lot against the name, although it, it gave us a lot of attention. So it, it's a powerful image. Um, and you've written in your, your scholarly work uh, about your activism, that you were consciously playing with um, these images, both in Israeli secular culture and in um, mm -hmm. religious uh, symbolism. 
in describing and elaborating the movement. Can you talk a bit about what, what the images were and, and how you were subverting them? What, what notions of mothers were you engaging with? It, 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 it's definitely um, a, a, a very uh, long and important conversation. And we can just touch on the tip of the iceberg here because uh, it's a, a definitely a loaded um, uh, issue. Uh, loaded, I mean that, ooh, they shoot at us so badly. Like they were trying everything uh, and using gender and motherhood, apparently it's a uh, uh, shooting into our stomach. I mean, uh, you are hysterical. Uh, the first thing, and uh, this came from um, the Ministry of Defense, this came from the government, and it was stupid. A lot of comments about how we don't understand and we are stupid, and we are letting our motherly um, emotion to, to make the decision, and the government or the country cannot follow hysterical mothers. By the way, this was one of Another reason why I didn't want to talk with uh, this uh, um, uh, correspondent because I said, one mother, immediately it would be taken to, uh, oh, she's weird, she's crazy, she's uh, anxious, all of this. She's not willing to sacrifice her son. She's a traitor, which was coming. Uh, and so I always wanted to show that we are, um, it's more than one mother, a lot of men, uh, including generals that uh, were released from the army. We insisted that we won't have anyone in duty because the army is supposed to do their job uh, separately from the politics. Uh, if sometimes they were confused about it. And we said, no, 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 we are not crossing this line in a democratic country. We had to insist on that, that the army is out of the, uh, the discussion. Uh, so we had to put in the front also people who were not mother to voice our opinions. So this happened in the beginning. Uh, do you want me to continue on that or, or do you want to ask me another question in regards? I, it sounds like you're in the middle of a story. So continue with that story. Okay. I have more questions, but we'll, we've got time. Okay. I guess I'm going further to the next question. Uh, uh, so uh when when we uh, let men speak for us in our events and and rallies uh certain feminist groups uh, especially the one from haifa uh let, they, these are followers of maybe someone you're familiar with i know that you have an her uh documents and archive in brandeis marsha friedman Yep. Uh, she's an American feminist who made Aliyah to Israel in the 70s. And during the 80s, she worked in Haifa University and um, uh, managed to get a lot of students and women there uh, to learn about feminist movements. And they adopted the American feminist uh, feminism that Marsha brought to them, which is a little bit difficult to to work with in Israeli society. You have to adopt the, the certain feminists that will fit the discussion. And so they were very upset at us that we are not enough in the front. We were in the front all the time. The interviewers, they were trying, and, and most of the time they were trying to put us in a place uh, across the table of a general saying, you don't understand. So you need to spend a lot of time in talk shows and events and rallies and panels to convince them I'm legitimate. I have a brain, I have a womb, but I have a brain as well and I can talk. But uh, we spend so much time on that and while we were doing that, our boys, our, uh, our soldiers were in danger. And why they were in danger, as I told you before, uh, because they got in trouble in Lebanon, uh, the, the, this war zone became even worse than to begin with. Uh, so we were trying to save, but what do we understand? So we had to quote 
uh, documents and books and uh, research of uh, people who know to be uh, with a militaristic background and therefore uh, they are more to uh, they uh, they can be more uh, reliable than us so uh, we've decided to take this uh, opportunity of them I'm so proud of them willing to talk for us a movement that's known by the name for mothers imagine a general that's retired from Lebanon just a few days ago coming and speaking in behalf of us I thought it's an amazing achievement uh, and just to so, put women in the so, front didn't work in the beginning so a feminism if, if I'm hearing you correctly what you were trying to develop was a feminism that you felt was more suited to the Israeli context yes and to especially to this life and death situation we are in a war every day that we don't get out of Lebanon we have more casualties and it's getting closer to home uh, my son uh, photo album have a lot of people 80 18 years old to 20 that are falling around him uh, literally from the group he, from the unit he was in and we know it's like a roulette it's just a matter of time so it's urgent and nobody actually uh, I don't know I don't know if to say nobody but it was not as urgent it was already uh, we started it after the helicopter crash it was 15 years after my son's father my husband fought in the same war and barely made it physically I'm not talking about emotional wounds which is another story uh, but um, what what we are learning here that we have to gradually make our way made our way into the the discussion table uh because we were bent from this table because of uh, yeah gender uh, issues that we women are not part of security uh topics discussions so we we gradually made it into the table and then they were fascinated by us because we knew more than a lot of parliament member, members obviously one we lived on the border second we learned the topic and we can learn you know we can be knowledgeable as well as any other person uh already at that time you have women doctors women in the academia by the way when i entered the talmud uh, my phd is from the hebrew university in jerusalem I got the same treatment, even worse, because I'm secular uh, from the academia. They didn't let me in uh, because I didn't have the right um, gender um, uh, background and so and so. So yeah, you have to force your way in. And one day actually i taught at the hartman institute in jerusalem if you know this place uh so after that i went to the knesset to get an award of women who made a change by alice shalvey and i uh wrote um, my uh presentation i i i wrote my uh, on a, a talmud page my words just because it was in my hand and I actually compared between the way women, women were addressed in Talmudic time by the sages when they were trying to leave their uh, domestic sphere and interfere in, in, in the uh, public sphere and bring their opinion to the military or security discussions that bended us. Actually, I showed the 2000 year, but they're using the same terminology. It was interesting. I think it's really powerful the way you show how you can uh, use the expertise you developed uh, in your PhD, which was on uh, women's leadership in Talmud, um, and use that as a, a basis for making these kind of arguments that invoke these religious images of women as well as the, the secular images of women. Um, you talked a bit about uh, how the rest of the Israeli women's movement responded to you. Um, I wonder if I can ask you a bit more about that. Um, 
for, for first, what were your influences? Um, the women in black had been operating in, in a public way since 1988. Um, were there other women's groups either domestically or, or internationally like the mothers of Plaza de Mayo that you look to uh, in uh, finding examples for successful strategies or arguments? Oh, that's a very interesting question. Uh, let me start with the um, Argentinian women. There was a very, really wonderful research. Many researchers are not so great because they don't see the archive, they don't see documents. I'm not talking even about, about the media. Uh, but this one uh, did a, a good job of tracking who we were actually because our image was so far on, on the media. Uh, for better or for worse, sometimes it was okay, sometimes not so. Uh, we fell into more into the Cinderella image that they were looking for. Uh, motherly, emotional, and so on, not so much educated. But so this research from the Truman Institute in Jerusalem compared between us and the Argentinian women. It's a very, very, uh, and it was translated to English. It's written in both English and uh, um, Hebrew. So I suggest you would pick it up. She did a very good job about it. Uh, so, no, we were not influenced by them. I was influenced more by, about it with the, uh, from the Vietnam uh, protest. Uh, Women in Black was actually the opposite of what we were trying to do uh, because Women in Black were, uh, they did what, fat, what was fit for them. They sat every Friday in different places around the, the country, mainly Jerusalem, and protested very silently. They are uh, more the typical women the society could swallow. They did not cause any antagonism. They did not shake the system as what we were trying to do. And what we were trying to do, I don't know, trying to do. I was just being myself. I don't think that I was trying to do anything. I was being myself, but more manipulative. Every time I learn how politics works and I understood that I need to find people, uh, uh, parliament uh, members that make the decision interest. What will serve them in their political venue, in their future? So it was targeting them to make a decision that will benefit their political career. I understood that. But other than that, I was being myself very forceful, like going after anything I want in life, like what I do usually, especially when it's about my life and my children being in danger. So I do what every mother would do. Actually, I was talking about it in the book that I am what they call in Israel, second generation for the Holocaust, for Holocaust survivors. So I was talking about, and, and being a, a growing up in a family of Holocaust survivors, soul survivor, survivors, um, definitely shaped me uh, uh, to be this kind of fighter. I'm fighting always for my life. Uh, they call it uh, internet, um, intergenerational uh, um, syndrome. Uh, like you are in the Holocaust. So I need sometimes to hold myself back and say, no, it's not the case. Uh, so at the night of the helicopter disaster, it brought me back to this time of the Holocaust. And I said, I need to save my family. So I was a lot more, I wouldn't say, I was a lot more assertive. I was uh, fighting for it. And therefore, I got knowledge. I did everything I had to do as a mother. What I didn't do, and I'm writing about it in the book, is when I'm actually serving my son's unit. My son's unit was a, a commando unit, elite commando unit. And they were located not far from our house. And we were the, um, the every time they needed something for the war, uh, and it's a very interesting list. I'm writing about it in the book. We actually were helping them to get all the last minute things that they needed before they enter Lebanon. Uh, and every time we got there and brought them food. And so we were like the, uh, uh, the, the support 
family of this unit. Uh, so uh, remember one day doing that or giving him uh, washing the laundry at home because uh, he used to call and say, can you come pick up the laundry? And I took him and it was the laundry and, and driving him back and I saying, what are you doing? Why are you bringing him back? Why? Uh, uh, then I remember Sarah and Abraham and Isaac's story. And I said, why, am, why are you participating in this? I wish, uh, then I wish I would be my mother and father in the Holocaust that will do everything to save their children. But I was more educated. So I did what I was expected to do. And I knew if something would happen to him, thanks God, my son physically uh, left Lebanon in peace. <laughs> uh, I, I knew that if something will happen to him physically, I'm saying physically because emotionally, this, this generation is scarred forever. Uh, and uh, I would not forgive myself that I was so normal and did what expected for me as a good Israeli uh, sacrificing mother, get the medal on your son's grave. I think that's something that um, those of us who don't live in Israel sometimes forget how, how intimate the relationship between uh, parents and children who are serving is. I'm always surprised when I'm, I'm speaking to friends saying, well, no, I have to go like take my daughter her groceries or, <laughs> or pick up her laundry in, in the army or that she's coming home for, for Shabbat. Um, we have a lot of uh, questions coming into the Q&A. Um, perhaps we'll turn to some of those. Um, there's, uh, Jamie asks, seeing the videos made by the soldiers 20 to 30 years ago made yeah. me think about the role of cell phones today. Yeah. Um, I think it relates to intimacy. Do you think that today with communications and video so much more prevalent that it makes the IDF more accountable? I don't know. I think that they always find a way. Um, I don't want to, I, I've been asked by, pro, you know, now there are a lot of protests in Israel and I'm very popular on how you achieve your goal in a protest. And I see a lot of similarities. Um, and technology is one thing that can make it better or worse, depends. But if you, what I'm saying that if you want to achieve your goal in this protest, you should, could, and would do it. And, and uh, technology is just one part. Uh, yeah, we didn't, we just started to have phone, uh, cell phones. Most of our communication was through fax among ourselves. We didn't have cameras yet on our cell phones. Um, so with technology, uh, the, the government still manipulate the situation uh, in a very efficient way. Uh, it's um, uh, just a force that you need to work against and there is always a new challenge and maybe technology is one of them i don't think that the army is more or any other organization uh is more accountable or less at the end of the day it depends on the people and their mindset the mindset in israel by the way even talking about our movement uh recently because my book is being published and if you want to read more it will be hopefully soon translated to english and you can read more or just get the Hebrew edition and put it on Google Translate. <laughs> uh, so uh, what I see that I've been, uh, I started to, until now I did not uh, want to be interviewed. For me, it was done. Uh, so now they, again, asking me about uh, my relationship with my son. They don't ask me about the way my conversation with, uh, parliament members and how we entered and made uh, a huge change in public opinion from 20% to almost 80%. So this was a very skilled and determined political work that we did. So I think that today uh, with technology, without technology, you still have to do the work and it's not one day and it's not six months, it can take years. And if we are not out there in the field or in the streets, other people are. And they're taking the country in the US, other places to where they want it to be, as you saw in the capital. 
So in order to prevent it, we cannot leave the field. We cannot have a vacuum and, and hoping that the country will continue the way we want it to be. Maybe through election, but it's not enough. So you, you mentioned your, your views and uh, how you share them with activists now. Can, can you say a bit more? Do, you, do people come to you for advice? And, yeah. um, you know, and, and are you involved in, in other campaigns right now yeah, in Israel? I am. I, 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 I'm always involved because I care and I am not leaving anything, which is when you do that, you don't have, a, I, I mean, oh, uh, you neglect your family, you really, uh, you cannot work, you, you just have to be all in. So I'm very active also with American groups. Uh, maybe you know the one creativ Creativity for Peace. Um, it's in, uh, located in Santa Fe and they do amazing work, but I'm mainly involved in coexistence. Like in the academia in the US, I meet a lot of people with all the right intention for human rights, but they don't understand what's happening there and they take sides. And it's usually they are against one side and for another side. Uh, and uh, sometimes I, I go there and I'm viewed as an Israeli and they uh, don't even want me to voice my opinions. And I'm quite shocked about it, that we are the people in the academia you need to support. We are saying what you want us to promote in Israel. We need your support because we have enough uh, criticism in Israel that we uh, talk about coexistence, coexistence, what some called in Israel right wing is the enemy. Uh, and two-state solution and all of that. But we, we uh, uh, Israeli academia is being bent, as you know, and maybe you experience it as well, as you know, in Berkeley and um, even other universities, when somebody here that I'm from Israel, doesn't matter what. So we need to work against it and more, uh, not against, we need to convince people that the only thing I want is coexist and help us coexist. And a lot of amazing work is being done. I actually took students for a um, uh, tour uh, Israel uh, to meet and meet with a group who works for coexistence. I believe in education for coexistence, and it takes a lot of time, and it has to go uh, to work uh, in against a lot of uh, violence that's happening on both sides and uh, casualties and and. So, but uh, really interesting group. So if you are looking to help world peace or at least the Middle East, uh, so find quite a group that works for coexistence. There are really uh, a, a lot of uh, nice work being done. So I'm very active in that. So th there are some questions going back to the relationship between you and uh, the other uh, leaders of the movement. Um, Mary asks, uh, are you still in touch with any of the women from the group or from the film? Orna's sad story likely isn't unique. How is she now? Okay, so yeah, it's, oh wow, this is a huge question. I write about it in the book. <laughs> it's really, everything you touch, it's like a conglomerate, like there's so much to talk about, and I feel really bad just touching it. Um, so, um, you have to understand that this movement started in the uh, northern reg region, in the upper Galilee. And we are, we are a small region, a small community. So these people that I came to, when I just came up with this crazy idea, enough is enough, after the um, uh, crash of the helicopters, uh, um, they are the people I grew up with. They know me. At the beginning, they said, what are you talking about? Are you crazy? Are you? But because they know me, I asked them as a personal favor, can you just join me? Like what I was telling you with this correspondent that wanted to come and talk with me. And I begged them, just come and sit with me. You don't have to do anything. And then my students, and then you start to get, so these people I knew before we raised our children together, of course we are in touch. We are. Uh, we have the most quiet time we ever had in the Galilee because our troops are out of Lebanon. Uh, many of them live on the border. Their houses are on the border. 
and it's more quiet than it was ever been after uh, more than 18 years of uh, our troops being fighting, protecting us from Lebanon. Uh, so uh, this is one. Now, because uh, my our proud day was um, our most um, uh, successful day was the day of, uh, when we left Lebanon in peace. And as promised, we said, because they accused us, you're running for politics and it's only, you're doing it to gain more or whatever. I don't know what you can gain. I was trying to gain my life back um, uh, uh, to make people safe, like it's not enough, but uh, it's always, you're looking for credit. Uh, and I said, no, 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 listen, when we will finish this job, we are going back to what we were and we are not running for politics or doing anything, which some feminist group was actually very upset at us about that. But I felt that we need to live this uh, mission of uh, as pure as we started, just uh, the power we gained and we gained a lot of power just for that and it was proven to be actually a good idea not only being a role model for people who get some power and don't use it to don't abuse it uh it was also that this movement was known as a success just because it stopped there and it achieved uh stopping one war in our region that was never done before so uh then I was not interested in anything else. Uh, and I said, we are done. Then in the second Lebanon war in 2006, there was um, some crazy idea of a government at a, cer at a certain point that we need to go back to, into Lebanon uh, because uh, three soldiers were kidnapped and killed and so. Uh, and, and by the way, they were kidnapped because the border was not protected, right? Which we always ask for the government. You know, we left Lebanon. Can you just put something that's not, uh, uh, um, uh, won't be capable to cross? Whatever you, you can think of. But the, the border was a joke at that time. It was not sufficient. And I knew that uh, it's so 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 much possible for uh, terrorists or whatever groups that are not part of Lebanese society just to cross the border and cause some problems. And this is what happened. And then we had the second Lebanon war. At that time, uh, certain people that were not even in the movement, including the morning mom that you see in the picture, uh, claim that they are part of the four mothers and they are actually supporting this war in Lebanon. So I had to ask a lawyer to send a, a letter to everyone. No one, no one can use the name of the movement, especially not to promote another war. I was not in the country. I was in the state at that time. My son, the soldier, became a pilot for United. So we came to be with him. Uh, he's back in Israel now. He's back in the kibbutz in the Galilee, but he was for 15 years a pilot for United. So we came to be with him for a little bit. My husband got a job here, so we stayed here. So, and I didn't want to talk about the movement. Into this vacuum came other people that did not do such a good job. For example, the morning mom. So in the film, if we talk about the film, so I were, while I was writing the book, they, we were also making the film and the film is kind of based on, some, on, uh, on the book. Uh, of course, 80% of it did not make it into the film, but this is another story. Uh, and at the end of it, they've decided to bring mourning uh, moms, bereaved uh, moms. And our title was, let's do something before and not only cry later, because the Israeli society treat uh, bereaved families differently. It's not, um, they, they are more as a symbol and as a mourning mom. And we had people like that. We have families who lost their children, but they were not in the front because we had to talk with them on, make them, assure them that we are only talking from logic and not, it's not emotional. It's only rational. 
So a lot of issues around that. Uh, so uh, this was one of them. And this woman especially did not want to be part of the movement. And then after the movement was disbanded, she started to get more attention and we uh, stepped aside. And I, I said, fine, if she's doing the thing that helps, go ahead. But then it was a little bit tricky when they raised money in our name. So we had to stop it. Now I'm appearing again. After 20 years, I wrote the book, I'm collecting it. I didn't have any interest, but then I felt that the movement is being taken to a place of bereaved uh, parents and more like the uh, uh, emotional, uh, the, the, we, we are being, uh, um, pe people feel for us. It's not like a logical thing to do. It's because we don't want any other children to be, uh, to die in the war and all these arguments are true as well. But I wanted to leave it also on the political level that this was wrong. And people who continue to stay in Lebanon did it for the wrong reason and were proving why it served their career and nothing else. So we couldn't uh, let ourselves get going after the emotional side. And the movement was more taken to the part where the media really liked it. So the morning mom, the crying. And uh, so, yeah, so this was an interesting um, uh, turn that the movement took. So, I mean, it, it sounds as if there were, there were some people who were drawn to the movement for the rational argument and some people who were drawn to the movement by, by the emotional resonance as well. And we always had both, of course, uh, but the problem was that uh, being emotional was our default uh, perception, right? So we had to work very hard to uh, convince the country, God forbid, we are not being emotional. It's just rational. Like we are talking with the commanders in the army, uh, like, uh, okay, they were so much more emotional about their militaristic uh, approach to life than we were. I No, I don't know. I don't want to compare you. Uh, but uh, to show always that it's a cold, rational argument. So this was the mission uh, to make this perception, to develop this image. I'm sure people who work in the academia or any other uh, job has sometimes have to, being a woman, I don't know, I have to prove more that they are knowledgeable definitely in the Talmud department in Jerusalem. That's for sure. You have to show that uh, before each class, I had to learn by heart the whole page and come to class and, blah, blah, and they were looking at me, what? How is this possible? And so, yeah you need to get at a certain time to a certain place and then they can accept you uh like talmudic leaders for who they are if you know the queen shlom Zion, for example that uh reigned israel for nine years the most peaceful years of uh the uh second uh temple period so the there's a question about the generals and politicians. Amir asks, did you have any positive experiences with Israeli politicians and generals? Yeah, we had also uh, some of them who supported us from the get-go, but you would be surprised these are not the left-wing parties. Uh, like if you are familiar with Israeli politics, so we have merits, the right wing. Now we don't know if they will make it to, through this election. Uh, and they were, uh, and peace now, actually, they were against us. They were actually treated as the men, especially if you know uh, the name, uh, Yossi Sarid and the leaders of Shalom Aksha, mainly men. Mm -hmm. uh, treated us almost the same, like our, uh, the people who were against us from the right-wing parties. Uh, because my knowledge in Talmud, I was very popular in uh, Shas, 
and for uh, and I had very personal nice relationship with the minister of religion and he invited me to talk with Shas about Talmudic tractates that talking about war and women and um, so it was a very interesting conversation uh, and the reason why left-wing parties were against us was the same reason why the state we were in, in touch with the state department in the united states and with kofi annan being the secretary of the united nation and actually we met with the clintons when they came to jerusalem you will see pictures in the book um and uh americans and israeli policy was that we are not going to leave lebanon without an agreement with syria and this was the um, when the prime minister Barack, the one that pulled us out of Lebanon, eventually, and we supported him, and therefore he was elected. Uh, uh, at the beginning, he, no one wants to to uh, leave Lebanon in peace the same way we entered. For all of a sudden, they had this uh, uh, grandiose ideas that the new Middle East while we are dying in Lebanon and we were trying to stop them from doing that because we knew and this um, negotiation the Syrian will retaliate against us every time they are stuck in negotiation and when we will have a lot of casualties we will fall down and give them a lot more uh, and which actually happened uh and then barack decided that he's stopping uh, that he's going to stop and get out of lebanon immediately uh so actually earlier than he expected uh because it was falling apart so he stopped uh, this great uh, i wish we would have uh, a negotiation with syria my house is next to the syrian border i wish we would have a, some kind of disagreement with that but you know it was uh uh, too much of a dream and too not so much reality. So they were very much against us about uh, the, the left wing parties. So I'd like to, in the time we have left, turn to thinking about the legacy of the yeah. Four Mothers movement. Um, Jamie asks, how do you think your movement has impacted Israel's views towards entering conflicts over the long term? Yeah, it's very, at the beginning, I thought it's not my place to to find the causality and what's the, the impact and was it. Uh, I said this would somebody else will say and research that. Uh, but then I found out a lot of interesting reaction to our work, which I want to um, uh, point out. Um, one was that the Israeli um, citizens are not going to be tolerant anymore to every crazy idea to go in, uh, to cross the border into uh, a war. And uh, the Israeli society will fight for a, a diplomatic or, or a negotiation rather than using the army, which usually, usually was in Israel the first um, reaction and still is in a way. Um, so they understand that Israeli, as they say, what do you think this is Switzerland? Like, God forbid you will be more normal and don't think that you need to send your troops into a war every time there is a crisis to, to so because the uh, IDF is so, um, uh, have, the, have the upper end in the region, uh, supposedly the upper end. Then they realize that maybe it's not so, the, the Israeli army is not so strong when uh, the, it's not being supported by, uh, so, by uh, citizens and the, the demonstration against retaliation. Uh, so this was one. The bad thing that happened because of that, they realized that if Israel society getting more normal and they're not less willing to get casualties and sacrifice their lives so quickly, no question asked, maybe we can uh, develop a new type of war. And when they, for example, one of the um, uh, wars in the Gaza Strip, they used the, more the Air Force and more artillery instead of letting soldiers in. 
So of course, they, they would have more casualties on the other side. So I thought that this was a really bad outcome from what we did that, uh, okay, mothers and, and citizens would not want to have casualties. So let's bomb everything and not even make a difference between citizens and others, I mean, they do make a difference, but not being so careful as you can be when you send your troops in. Uh, so this was a very bad outcome. Uh, and and uh, the, the other thing is that uh, I thought we opened more of a crack for women to be part of military and security issues discussion. But as I said, now, 20 years after, and especially because of the image of their bereaved mom and their arguments, uh, it was more back to, refer, they refer to us, and this is also something I've decided I need to write about it. Look what an amazing operation we, have, we had there. Um, that it's not only that we are crying about our children and there you, feel, you will feel bad for us and, and send the troops back, back home. It's not only because you feel pity for us. This is not the way it's going to be uh, happening. And this was more the image they developed during the years. And now I feel that we need to bring back the discussion of we can talk to you, we can understand and what you're doing is wrong and we need to part be part of the discussion around uh, the table when you deal with security issues. Women, citizens, as much as anybody else. No, I, I think that's an important element of your legacy, um, that it's not just the withdrawal from Lebanon in 2000, yeah. but it's also changing the conversation yeah. to say that ordinary citizens who are not generals, who don't have expertise, also have something to contribute and something to say. Um, yeah. and need to be engaged in conversation. Sometimes on the contrary, because generals, obviously, they are invested in one uh, particular front and they know how to do certain things. They're not necessarily qualified or not supposed to be part of this conversation. They're supposed to give us ideas how to protect the border. And when the government decided that she's, she's, uh, the government is not going to do anything else other than you sending the troops, then they can go to the army and ask, so what can be done? Uh, so yeah, it's a very tricky, uh, uh, a fragile uh, conversation. And uh, plus also that you must and can uh, get up and, and work for change. Because if not, don't be surprised that the, the world is not acting according to the morals you are looking for. So you're sharing this story now in a number of ways, um, through the film, uh, through the book, um, and just there, there's, there's a question about uh, how to get the book and uh, the title of the book. Yeah. So it's, it's coming out in Hebrew. What's the, what's the title? Yeah. Uh, actually, I've decided to write it first in Hebrew because I felt that we need this discussion in Israel, and I was surprised how relevant it is and how interested people are in it. Uh, I appeared on every media and radio. You can check my, my website, uh, rachelbendor.com, and also there is a link to the archive that is under uh, Ohio State University. Um, and it's designed to work uh, uh, for English speakers. Uh, the documents uh, are in Hebrew, some of the articles are in English, and, uh, but for every document in Hebrew, there is a short description what this document is about, and you can uh, decide if you want to translate it or not. Uh, and we need a lot of more support and work on the archive. So if there are students or anyone who are looking to help um, develop the archive, because I have so many more documents uh, that are so interesting, including from the State Department. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and other, other countries as well, that uh, the relationship with us, how to be in touch with us and how much they can influence Israeli politics or not. Um, and uh, so whoever wants to participate in this and help me translate the book into English, 
uh, I would be very, very happy to get any support. Uh, I'm working on it these days uh, to translate it to English. It can happen very quickly. I just need some venue to find the right ways to do it. So. So, so we'll look out for the book in English. Um, and just yeah. in, in the last minutes, you mentioned the archive um, and uh, Brandeis also has a project to create Jewish feminist collections and has been inviting uh, Jewish 20th century feminists to donate their papers and make them available. And uh, we have scholars who come and work with them. We have students who work with directly with the materials like Marsha Friedman's archive and Aviva Cantor's archive. Um, how did you decide to, to donate your archive and make it available? So I would like a place that it would not uh, stay in the box and uh, there would be an interactive um, uh, work around it, meaning that uh, there would be a class or students will uh, research more about it and to find ways for these documents to be in. Also, if you talk about brand I saw, most of our content, because I was the chairperson and did most of the event, was based on biblical text. And I also wrote a lot about the use of uh, religious text in political debate, because before us, secular left-wing peace movement dealing with religious text, uh, it's uh, kind of an, an anomaly. It was a phenomena. Usually it's not being done. So if you are interested in the Jewish aspect, the uh, Judaic text, Jewish text aspect of the movement, there is, uh, it was very, it was quite convincing actually. I was also very surprised by the Israeli media that was so attracted to this image of, uh, we are kibbutzniks, we are former kibbutzim. So it's the most secular um, uh, society using religious text for peace. So it was uh, quite a unique aspect that you can also research about it. And you can see a lot about it in the uh, archive. A lot of my notes are written on uh, uh, Talmudic uh, pages or stuff like that. So on, on one side, there is the page I was reading at that day. On the other side, is it like in the middle of the class, uh, they came into the college and asked to interview me. So, yeah. <laughs> Well, I think I, I can speak for everyone who saw the film and who's participated in the panel discussion today that we're great, very grateful that you've shared the story in, in these many ways and look forward to exploring the archive. Thank That's you so much. Continued. And go and do the work. Don't give up on any ideas that you want. Just go fight for it and then you'll have the world you deserve. We deserve. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you so much, uh, Rachel, for being here with us. And thank you, Lisa, for this really illuminating conversation. We did post a link in the chat to the archive so people can look there to learn more. Um, and thank you, everyone who joined us, who asked questions, um, who watched the film. And the film will be available through March 10th. Um, and then I know is going on to many other festivals. So, so tell your friends around the world, um, and it will come to them soon. Um, thank you again, and I hope to see you soon. Thank see you. you. Happy occasions. Thanks.